So then let's start our today um, seminar. So today uh, speaker uh, is Ben Gamich from Harvard and uh, the title is Structural Features of 3D Mirror Symmetry. So Ben, please. All right, great. Thanks so much. Thank you for inviting me to, uh, to speak here. Um, I, uh, as I, as I said before, I, I don't kind of have a, you know, necessarily a punchline for this talk. Um, I would love if people would sort of interrupt me with, with questions. Um, I, uh, and I know that kind of, uh, Justin Hilburn, um, who I'm sort of working on a lot of these projects with has also spoken on this material in this seminar and also Simone has spoken on some related topics and, and various other people. So, you know, some of this may, may be, uh, may be old news. Some of this, uh, I will try and, uh, uh, make new. I'll sort of give, hopefully try and talk about some things that other people have not mentioned. And I will also in particular try and like do some explicit calculations so that kind of we uh, you know have some practice doing that, um, but but uh, anyone can feel free to direct me in a in a different direction if there's if there's something I say that you know you'd like to hear more about. Um, okay, so that said, let's get started. Um, and, and I've I've written some papers here. Sorry, they're they're a bit small. Um, there's sort of uh, there's this paper with Aaron Maselgy and Justin Hilburn, um, which Justin spoke about uh, last uh, last year maybe in this seminar. Um, and then I'll also talk about a, a paper with Justin Hilburn, um, which is on the archive, and then some ongoing work with, with Justin again. Um, and so I'll, I'll make clear sort of where, where things are in those various things. Um, okay, so this is a talk about 3D mirror symmetry, um, which uh, I think a lot of people are familiar with at this point, but let me just remind you that 3D mirror symmetry sort of is supposed to be some kind of duality and the way I'll phrase it is it's going to be a duality between, um, oops, let me minimize this so it's not in my way. This up here. Uh, sorry, I'm just moving my zoom windows around. There we go. A duality between uh, holomorphic symplectic stacks. So the examples that we're supposed to keep in our mind are um, so the, the sort of simplest and most fundamental example um, is supposed to be that the, the cotangent bundle of C star, right? So my favorite symplectic varieties are cotangent bundles of, of algebraic varieties. Um, and this is supposed to be dual to the cotangent bundle of B C star, of the classifying stack of, of, uh, of C star, where now the sort of, whoops, where now the, the C star on the right is, um, is the dual torus to the C star on the left. Uh, so that's that's kind of the, the, the fundamental uh, duality here in, in a way that kind of we'll see reoccur, we'll see this duality reoccur again and again throughout this talk. Um, and then just to kind of fill, fill out this, uh, this, uh, this chart a little bit, sort of the next basic example you might ask about is sort of, well, okay, I've told you what uh, B of a torus what about the cotangent bundle of B of a group, the classifying stack of a reductive algebraic group G? Um, and the answer is going to be, actually, I'm going to call this G check. The answer is going to be the sort of by Whitaker reduction of T star G. So T star G is acted on by um, its, uh, its uh, uh, this uh, subgroup of, of nilpotent matrices. It's a Hamiltonian action on both sides. And I can take a Hamiltonian reduction at a, at a regular character chi on each side. Um, this is, uh, um, th this is uh, also known as the, the group scheme of regular centralizers. It's ubiquitous in, in representation theory. It occurs in a lot of places. Um, Konstantin Telemann calls this the, the BFM space after some work of Bezrukovnikov, Finkelberg, Mirkovich. Um, uh, yes, and this G check on the right-hand side is the Langlands dual group. So this suggests that already in the first line, there was a, a Langlands duality happening. And we'll, we'll see this sort of happen again in this talk. One of the goals of today's talk is for me, uh, uh, I want to uh, give some justification for the sort of causal duality that occurs in representation theory a lot. And I want to explain to you where that causal duality comes from, from the perspective of two categories. So I'll, I'll say that again a little bit later, but this is already suggesting some of this sort of Langlands duality is, is supposed to be, uh, you know, uh, underlying some of this. And then of course, the next thing you might ask is, well, okay, I've told you about the cotangent bundle of point modic group. What would happen if I had the cotangent bundle of say a, a, a vector space modic group? 
like say V is a representation of the group G. And in that case, uh, this sort of dual to this has a name. It goes by the name of the uh, Braberman Finkelberg Nakajima Coulomb branch construction. So they gave some uh, some way of, of starting from this thing on the right hand side, producing a, a, a thing on the left hand side. So Ben, okay. uh, you kind of uh, uh, gave answers, uh, but uh, what's the question? Should we read right. physics papers in order to understand why one is dual to the other one, or there is? Some... Yeah. So um, that's uh, that's that's a. Uh, well, uh, that's a good question. Um, let me say that um, roughly speaking, um, let me say that in, in the case when both sides are cotangent bundles, so okay, so th there's supposed to be some some three-dimensional field theory. So, so I'll, I'll get into this a little bit later, but um, roughly speaking, if I tell you something like T star X is dual to T star Y, then uh, one way that duality manifests is going to be as an equivalence of two categories a pair of two categories, where on, on the left-hand side, I'm going to have some two category of what I'll call perverse sheaves of categories on X. And on the right-hand side, I'm going to have some two category of coherent sheaves of categories on Y. Um, so that that to me is kind of the, uh, so if we, if we put on our sort of TQFT hats and we think that we have a duality of, of we have some equivalence between two three-dimensional topological field theories, a three-dimensional topological field theory is supposed to have a two category of boundary conditions. Um, and so like roughly speaking, like one, one way you might understand what this duality is, is it's, is it's telling you some equivalence, which is of this form. Now I haven't defined what these two categories are, but you know we that, that that's at least the sort of flavor of of this kind of thing, um, and uh, maybe maybe I, I should just add one more thing that this gives you an explanation now from this already. Like if you if you think really hard about kind of uh, uh, TQFTs, then you can figure out right now what this BFN Coulomb branch operation is. That the BFN Coulomb branch operation says. If I started with T star X um, and I wanted to know what its dual is, how could I do that? Um, and, and then I might sort of look at this picture I have. And on the right-hand side, I have this coherent sheaves of categories. It's some two category. Um, and, and I might say, well, like, at a, at a, how could I use this two category to produce the algebra of functions on Y? So the point is that sort of functions on Y um, should be something like local operators local operators in this TQFT, which is what this TQFT assigns to a two-sphere. So there should be some kind of operation called like, if I have a two category, like what does, what, what can I like put that two category on a two-sphere somehow? So the, the BFN construction, now I'm telling you like sort of what the BFN construction is, it's sort of think hard about what this sort of perverse sheaves of, of categories on, on X thing is. And uh, sort of imagine what it might mean to put that on a two sphere. And that is the BFN construction. So I, I, I could say this in a little more detail, but this is sort of a rough way of, of sort of justifying why my heuristic is good, because it tells you that like, if you understood this duality in this way, then already you could figure out um, how to get the algebra of functions on the, on the dual of a space. Uh, yeah. So okay. So that's that's sort of a, a rough already sort of you know uh, 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 theory of, of what it might mean to, to have this duality here. Um, I'll, I'll give I'll sort of go into more details about, about this um, a, a little bit later. And sort of once again, the goal of this talk is going to be to sort of start from this equivalence of two categories and then kind of like uh, sort of evaluate those two categories on lower dimensional manifolds and and from that sort of recover some invariants that that we're more familiar with. Any other questions, sort of, uh, just from this sort of introductory thing? OK. Um, so today, um, what we are going to be interested in is uh, uh, the, the case of the above when G is an abelian group. So G is going to be a C star to the K. Um, it's going to be C star to the K, so it's going to be abelian. Um, and maybe just to sort of uh, to say what V is, let's take V to be C star to the N. Uh, let's take V to be an N-dimensional vector space. 
So if G acts on an n-dimensional vector space, that gives us some embedding of G into C star to the n, right? This C star to the n is acting on my vector space V, um, which is C to the n. Um, and let's just write an exact sequence. Um, let me call the quotient torus here, C star to the n mod G, let me call this F. So physicists would call that torus F because that's the flavor torus. It's the torus of symmetries, residual symmetries after you take the quotient V mod G. Um, so I can now sort of add one more line to the above. Maybe I'll write this in a different color that if I had T star of uh, you know C to the n mod G here, where G is uh, as I've written it above, then um, this is supposed to be dual to the cotangent bundle of C to the n mod F check. Um, so what I mean by that is that these two copies of C to the n on the two sides, this side and this side, are dual vector spaces. So one of them is like V and one of them is V check. And so sort of if C star to the n naturally acts on V, then the dual naturally acts on V check. So I have this dual exact sequence F check, C star to the n acting on V check, going to G check. Um, so th this is the kind of duality which, which I'll be talking about in, in this talk. And uh, there's also going to be two more parameters here. I'll call them alpha and beta, um, which I'll, I'll describe the role of those parameters in a moment. And they're going to switch roles when I go to the other side. So these two parameters are going to be, uh, are going to uh, uh, play opposite roles on, on the two sides of this thing. Okay, so uh, that, that, that's the setup of, of today's talk. So now I can sort of explain, now in, in, the, in the first part of the talk, I'd like to explain more about this situation. So in other words, the first part of the talk is going to be about the geometry of hypertoric varieties. Um, so I know I sort of started this talk, uh, I mentioned some sort of two categories here, um, but actually a large part of this talk, I really want to be just about, like not about any of this fancy two category stuff, but just about geometry because these, these hypertoric varieties that I'm going to describe, um, which are sort of uh, Hamiltonian reductions of T star C to the N by G, uh, these, these spaces are like the testing ground for everything you want to know about kind of symplectic resolutions, Coulomb branches, uh, you know, hyper, hyper Kähler manifolds, uh, you know, uh, holomorphic symplectic varieties, whatever, like they sort of already see all the, all the uh, phenomena there. So I, I want to advertise that this is a really rich testing ground and also that they're very explicit. Um, so I should say these, these were first, these varieties I'm about to discuss were first called the uh, Toric hyperkähler manifolds in the original paper by Goto where they were introduced. Uh, they were laser studied by Kono, by um, I wanna say Housel Sturmfels, Proudfoot, um, many people up through uh, Braden Proudfoot, Licata Webster. Um, who wrote this, uh, who wrote some papers that I'm going to sort of categorify now. Um, okay, so, so what are these varieties? Um, so, okay, so we're, we're, so as I said, we're looking at this sort of T star of C to the N mod G here. So let me start looking at T star C to the N. And there's a C star to the N action on this, as I said, and G is a subtorus here. Um, and the C star to the N action is of course Hamiltonian because it's acting on this C to the N on the base of the cotangent bundle. So that gives me a Hamiltonian action on the whole cotangent bundle. So it has a moment map. Sorry, your N is equal to K or what? Because My what? You, you said that previously the torus of a smaller dimension acts on CN. And now you, you say that your torus... Ah, it's embedded. I have a G here, yes. So I have ah, the okay. full C star to the N is acting on here, and then I have my G as a subtorus here on the on the left-hand side. So I, I just wanted to start with the full torus and then go back to my subtorus in a second, uh, just because this way I can write down the formula more easily. So um, the, the sort of moment map naturally goes to C to the N, which is uh, the Lie algebra of the dual torus of C star to the N. Um, so uh, what, what is this moment map? If I write x1 dot 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 xn, y1 dot 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 yn as my coordinates on the cotangent bundle of C to the n, this maps to um, x1 y1 dot 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 xn yn. Right, so I started with this C star to the n because uh, that let me write down a formula for the moment map easily. Uh, but then I can say that, okay, this G inclusion into C star to the n gives me a projection map here down to the dual Lie algebra of um of uh of g 
Um, so uh, th this sort of, if I compose th this map here, uh, this moment map with this thing here, this is the sort of moment map for the G action. Uh, so you know, I, I leave it as an exercise for people to figure out how to how to compose this this projection to the Lie algebra of G to get a formula for the for the G moment map. Um, okay, so uh, that that that's this moment map that I have, and then what am I going to do with it? So this lets me understand what I mean by this stacky quotient here. So okay, these these cotangent bundles. So here I'm taking the cotangent bundle of an algebraic stack up here at the top of the page. I have a cotangent bundle of, of c to the n mod g of this Artin stack, um, which people may or may not be familiar with. But it turns out it's actually a, a very simple thing to describe it. Um, so the cotangent bundle of c to the n mod g, um, I can describe it by the usual way I describe any quotient in, in symplectic geometry. Cotangent bundle of something mod g should be the same thing as uh, like take a Hamiltonian reduction of the cotangent bundle by g, which means, in other words, impose a moment map and then take a quotient. So this thing sort of almost by definition is equal to mu inverse of zero mod g, which is a stack. So I'm, I'm using this notation to, to describe a stack here. Um, so so uh, th this is a stack, and this is sort of what uh, my first paper with Aaron and Justin was about, is somehow it's it's uh, more natural to sort of start by considering these stacks. But ultimately in life, sometimes we like varieties, right? So the next question is, how do you sort of from this stack go to a variety? And so what I'm going to, to do is I'm going to introduce a stability parameter, alpha, which is going to live inside the uh, real Lie algebra of uh, real dual Lie algebra of G. So this alpha is a stability parameter. And what that's going to do for me is instead of taking a stacky quotient, I can take a, um, a, a GIT quotient, mu inverse of zero GIT quotient uh, by G with parameter alpha. So really, maybe I should have taken alpha to be integral. Um, and uh, that way, it sort of specifies a line bundle, or at least sort of rational. So it specifies some kind of like rational line bundle. Um, but uh, whatever, it's, it's specifying me a, a sort of chamber that I'm using to describe a, a GIT stability condition. So this thing, let me give this a name. Let me call this um, XG of alpha. I'll, I'll call this variety. This is you know my, my hypertoric variety. Hypertoric. So this is what I'm calling a hypertoric variety. And then um, it, it has a, uh, so it, what do I mean by this GIT quotient? One way to understand how GIT quotients work is that XG of alpha is equal to, I take uh, my, my mu inverse of zero as before. Um, and then before I take this G quotient, I restrict to some kind of semi-stable locus. So there's there's some set of points inside of mu inverse of zero that's the sort of uh, alpha semi-stable points, and then I take my G quotient. So this is just sort of basic GIT theory, but the point is that this embeds this uh, variety as an open subset inside of the stack which I was studying before. So this says that if I'm interested in these varieties, um, they actually embed as, as, as open subsets of, of stacks. So it, it sort of makes sense that I'm studying this stack first, and then I can study the variety afterward. So the example, which we're supposed to keep in our heads here, is that if G is a copy of C star acting on C to the N by the diagonal action, um, then uh, I can consider this cotangent bundle of C to the N mod C star and inside of this cotangent bundle, if I pick a, a, a non-zero character for G, so there's only two GIT stability chambers. I can take either one. I'll take the positive one. And then the stable locus inside of here is the cotangent bundle of C to the N minus zero mod C star, which is T star P to the N minus one. So this shows that T star P N minus one embeds as an open subset inside of this stack. Namely, it's the complement of the cotangent fiber of over zero. Complement of cotangent fiber to C to the N at zero, mod G, mod C star. Okay. 
So those those are the uh, those are the varieties that we're going to be studying. Um, and again, this is sort of a, a general uh, a general paradigm here is that if we're interested in these varieties, so these varieties, okay, so I, I cheated here to take a specially nice example, um, which is a which is still a cotangent bundle, right? Uh, in general, I'm not going to get a cotangent bundle. Maybe I ought to say that if I take G to be C star to the n minus one, um, uh, which is in, inside of uh, C star to the n. So it's like the kernel of the multiplication map for that multiplies all the coordinates on C star to the n. Um, so this thing acts on C to the n. And in this case, uh, the variety I'm going to get, my sort of xg of alpha is going to be a resolution of the an singularity, C2 mod Z mod n minus one, if I've gotten my numbers right, uh, which I don't guarantee that I have. Maybe... Sorry, if n is okay, I, I probably did not get this number right, but uh, you could okay. If n is two, then I should have gotten. Uh, I guess so maybe it's just n here. Sorry, there we go. Um, yeah, so this this thing is not a cotangent bundle. So the 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 moral of this story somehow is that if you're a symplectic geometer, you like cotangent bundles because those are your favorite spaces in the world. Um, like everything in terms of a cotangent bundle, you can describe in terms of the geometry of the base. And you can like forget about symplectic geometry. You can just look at the geometry of whatever the base of your cotangent bundle is. These manifolds I'm talking about, these hypertoric varieties, XG alphas, are not in general cotangent bundles, but they embed as open subsets of cotangent bundles. So the best way to study them, um, and, and for some of the invariants I'm going to discuss, the only way to study them uh, is to embed them as open subsets inside of cotangent bundles, which, which luckily we, we have here via this sort of, we, we're really starting from this sort of stacky presentation here and then turning on this parameter alpha. Maybe I'll just say out loud, you know, when, when I say that like we really need to embed them as open subsets of cotangent bundles, um, like one, one place you see that for instance is in, if you're interested in say, for instance, counts of quasi maps in these varieties, as sort of a lot of people traditionally when they talk about 3D mirror symmetry, they're interested in, in counts of, of quasi maps um, and to define what a quasi map even is, you have to know that your variety embeds as an open subset of some stack. So like already, even to define that invariant, you needed to know this presentation. So this sort of presentation, the, the fact that these spaces come from gauge theory, in a sense, is, is very important to whatever I'm saying. Um, okay, so how am I going to understand the geometry of these spaces? Um, so that, that basically all the geometry of these spaces is going to be encoded in, in some Lagrangian subspace. So uh, we are interested in a certain Lagrangian, Lagrangian subspace of these varieties. Um, so let me define it. Definition. Um, I'm going to, so inside of T star C to the N, um, I'm going to define a Lagrangian, which I'll call L. And what it's going to be, it's going to be the union of conormals to intersections of coordinate hyperplanes. Right, so inside of C to the N, I have some coordinate hyperplanes like x1 equals zero, x2 equals zero, or like both of them equals zero. And I want to take for each of those intersections, uh, I want to take the uh, I want to take the conormal to that subspace of, of C to the N. Right, so the example, uh, the first example is like inside of um, T star C. Uh, I have uh, the zero section, so that's uh, you know. Uh, an intersection of no coordinate hyperplanes, you would say. Um, union, sort of, I have one coordinate hyperplane, which is z equals zero. Um, so union t star zero c. So I could draw this thing like this. Here's the zero section, and here's the, uh, the co-normal coming out of it. So I've got this sort of uh, coordinate cross type thing inside of here. So um, you mean and... co-normal to, to the orbits of the action of your group? Why, why yes, closure? so conormals to yes. So the, the closures of well, conormals to the closures of orbits for the C star to the N action. Hmm. So I take the sort of maximal torus acting on this thing, and uh, that that has a bunch of orbits, and I yes, take the conormals to the closures of all of those orbits. 
Uh, and, and the way that you can picture this, and this is more than just picturing it, but somehow this is when, when you talk to someone who studies these varieties a lot, they always tell you that everything about these varieties is just combinatorics, which is true. Um, and what combinatorics is the combinatorics of hyperplane arrangements. Um, and the way that you can see that is that, so I have this C star action on T star C, this Hamiltonian C star action. Um, but I can also think of it, so before I was thinking of it as sort of Hamiltonian for the complex symplectic form. But I can also think of the sort of, at least the compact S1 action as Hamiltonian for the, um, uh, for the sort of real Kähler form on T star C. So I have a, a, a real moment map I'll call this mu r because it's a real moment map. And so this thing goes to the dual Lie algebra of, uh, of S1. So it goes to r. Um, and what, what is this moment map? This moment map takes x, y in T star c, and it maps it down to uh, norm of x squared minus norm of y squared. OK? And so if I sort of think about uh, what, where this where this Lagrangian goes? Maybe I should have been. Normally, I'm better at using colors. This Lagrangian is is L here, so I'll try and uh, draw this in colors. This thing is all yellow now. So if I try and think about where this yellow thing goes, um, so inside of R, um, so my copy of C is of course the copy where y is equal to zero. So that just goes to the positive uh, real axis inside of C. Uh, yeah, maybe I should draw this in in two colors. So I'll, I'll draw this like, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll rewrite this here. This is the union of C union um, T star zero C. So I can see that my sort of, uh, my zero section goes to this bit here and my other component of my Lagrangian goes to the other chamber here because the other component is where X is equal to zero. So I only have a Y. So that goes right to the negative part. Um, so uh, in, in this picture, I can see that actually the components of my Lagrangian correspond to chambers in this hyperplane arrangement. So, and so uh, similarly, uh, oh. Just question, uh, since you mentioned um, some more general symplectic stacks in the beginning, mm -hmm. uh, is there a single uh, L, the skeleton, which in for, for every symplectic uh, stack which appears in this business, 3D mirror symmetry? Uh, that is a good question. Um, uh, let me, uh, uh, I, so, okay, well, it, it, we don't know. I mean, okay, so first of all, maybe we don't know what the full generality of, of spaces appearing in this 3D mirror symmetry is. Maybe a, a good level of generality to consider is, is sort of this line here of like T star V mod G. Um, I would say that in that case, uh, we do uh, sort of know an L, uh, which is which is the right thing to study in that T star V mod G case, uh, which you can find in the papers of, of Ben Webster. Um, roughly speaking, um, what, what you should, uh, roughly speaking, um, hmm. Somehow, uh, okay, maybe let me let me uh, return to this question a little bit later, but let me say that what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to impose a couple of parameters alpha and beta here, which one of this alpha is going to uh, delete the sort of unstable components of my Lagrangian, and then another uh, 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 parameter beta is going to delete some further pieces of my Lagrangian. Um, but the thing you get after imposing both of those components uh, is, is, uh, is well known. Um, and uh, we we do have a, a you know an answer for what it is in this T star V mod G case. And I, I think I, I've been told that this this Lagrangian maybe that, that you get in the end after I impose both of these parameters is the uh, support of of this stable envelope which controls a lot of three D mirror symmetry. Um, so, but as far as your question goes, this L which I've started out with before I impose these parameters. Um, I think that we're a little more confused about what the physical meaning of, of this L is, or sort of wh where it came from. Um, yeah. Okay, so that's my answer for now. Uh, and let me let me just add, as, as long as I have this, this example here, that you can similarly do the example with, with hyperplane arrangements for sort of T star C2. Um, so now I will map down to R2. Um, and uh, now I can draw my hyperplane arrangement inside of R2, and it's going to have four pieces. 
So over on the right-hand side, I had two pieces. So this one was C, and this one was the uh, co-normal to zero inside of C. Here I'm going to have, here's my C2. Here's the co-normal to the uh, sort of like Y equals zero piece. Here's the co-normal to X equals zero. And here's the co-normal to the origin. OK. Um, and, and similarly, I should say that since I'm going to be interested in these stacks also, um, this L um, it, it defines a sort of uh, Lagrangian inside of the cotangent bundle of C to the N mod G also. So I'll call this maybe LG is the sort of uh, image of this thing downstairs. So I mean, when, one way you can say this is that this L is totally contained inside of mu inverse of zero. So right, I, I uh, this T star C to the N mod G, I said its definition is that it's mu inverse of zero mod G. So my L is totally contained inside of this mu inverse of zero. So I can take its image under the G quotient. And that's what this LG is going to be. So okay, I've defined for you some Lagrangian, which I'm telling you sort of controls all the symplectic geometry, or at least the part we're interested in inside of these stacks. Um, and so there's there's one more thing. Uh, there's there's maybe two more things I need to say about uh, symplectic geometry here. Um, so one of them is I need to tell you how to impose this uh, this uh, this stability parameter. So I wrote down this parameter alpha here, and I said I want to pass to a hypertoric variety. So how am I going to do that? Um, so once again, I'm going to use the projection. So this R two was like the the real Lie algebra of the uh, Maybe I can put it this way. This is the Lie algebra of like a, a T to the N dual. Um, this is the dual of the sort of uh, Lie algebra of the compact n-dimensional torus that's acting. Um, and so that thing, if I look at this- N, I, N equal two here? Or yes, where N equals two, uh, yes, where N equals two right there. Um, but now I'm going to let N equal N down, down here where I'm writing. And so this Rn has a projection to the uh, real dual Lie algebra of G, right, um, for, for N general. Um, so this I will call P for this projection. Um, and then inside of here, I have this parameter alpha. So I can ask for what's the inverse of, of, uh, of alpha under this map. P inverse of alpha is inside of here, right? So if I took P inverse of zero, then what I would get would be some linear subspace inside of Rn um, and, and if I take P inverse of alpha, now I'm translating that. So I get some affine subspace inside of uh, R to the N. So let me do the example here of what that subspace is. Um, so for C2 mod C star, so I'm letting N equals two again. So let me draw my two, my uh, C2, T star C2 hyperplane arrangement here. Um, my linear subspace sort of would be um, this linear subspace here. Maybe I should do that in a different color. Um, it would be this, this linear subspace here, um, only I've translated it by alpha. So what I'm going to get is I'm going to get maybe uh, this linear subspace here, which is slightly translated off. So that's what, uh, maybe I should use, sorry, I'm gonna use a different color for that. Um, I'll use green, it's this linear subspace here. And that's what this P inverse of alpha is in this case. Um, and uh, since I've taken a quotient by C star now, if I sort of think about, well, actually, let me, let me say my, my sort of fact first, which is like what, what sort of makes the geometry interact with the combinatorics very well, is that the alpha unstable locus, unstable locus. So again, I'm studying the geometry of this variety. I want to know what to delete in order to, uh, in order to understand it. And in order to understand it, uh, 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 in order to, I want to know what this alpha unstable locus is. And the fact is that this alpha unstable locus um, corresponds to the pieces of this Lagrangian. Um, so the, the components of this Lagrangian L, as we said, or LG, corresponded to chambers in this hyperplane arrangement. And the alpha unstable locus corresponds to chambers um, which uh, don't intersect uh, this P inverse of alpha, right? So it's just this chamber here. So this is my T star zero C2. This is my unstable chamber here, right? In the example we discussed above, we said to get the cotangent bundle of P1, we start with cotangent bundle of C2 mod C star and we delete this unstable piece here. Um, so this is unstable. Uh, so so that's, that's very nice. Um, uh, 
Yes, that this P inverse of alpha precisely tells you what to delete. And now since I've taken a C star quotient, you can see that kind of uh, the, the pieces in this in this hyperplane arrangement are uh, sort of like, I, I should really imagine this, let me draw my green thing now. So I'm just redrawing my P inverse of alpha here. But since I've taken a quotient by C star, oh yeah, and this thing inherits a hyperplane arrangement by where it intersects these hyperplanes. And now I can see that like, if I look at this hyperplane arrangement, I really am seeing like T star P1, right? Here's a P1 and uh, here is a, uh, you know, T star of zero of P1 and here's a T star infinity of P1. Um, so once again, the, the, the sort of geometry here is, uh, is, uh, is you, you, can, you can read it right off of the hyperplane arrangement. So I'm going to give this new Lagrangian a name um, I'm going to call this thing LG of alpha. So let me define what, what I mean by this. This is going to be my original Lagrangian, LG, right? My original Lagrangian L quotiented by G minus um, the alpha unstable locus. So this LG of alpha is, you might call this the alpha stable Lagrangian. So okay, so this is this is almost the uh, everything I need in order to uh, in order to uh, explain the the sort of duality here. Only I need one more thing. So so now I've I've given you all the tools you need to understand what is this hypertoric variety where I impose alpha. But now I, I look back up at what I told you originally. I said there were two parameters alpha and beta that get switched here. So if I imposed this, uh, and, and what I want to do is I want to uh, get hypertoric varieties on both sides. So I impose this parameter alpha on one side, but it looks like on the other side, I need to impose a, a different parameter beta. So I can ask, well, what's that parameter going to do here? Um, and by, by type checking, um, I can see that since my original parameter alpha lived in G check, since G check and F switch roles under this duality, if you remember this, this exact sequence of tori here, G check on the one side corresponds to F on the other side. Um, so that means, and so alpha lived in the sort of real uh, G check R. So uh, what, I, what I have here is I'm going to define a new parameter. Um, I'll call it the Hamiltonian parameter. Hamiltonian parameter. Beta, this is going to live inside of um, the Lie algebra of, the real Lie algebra of F. Um, and so what it is, if I imagine that beta is integral, then it defines me a, a co-character of the torus F. Um, so F is the thing, if you recall, F is the residual torus that's still acting on C to the N mod G, or it's acting on my, on my uh, hypertoric variety. And now I'm going to define a, a new Lagrangian, LG of alpha comma beta. So I'm going to restrict this Lagrangian a little bit more. Um, so the definition of this is going to be, I'm going to take all of the points in this Lagrangian I just defined, all of the X in LG of alpha, um, such that uh, the flow of X, uh, the limit as, uh, as uh, Z uh, goes to infinity, whoops, as Z goes to infinity, where Z is a, is a parameter inside, my, inside this C star here. Um, so Z acts on, so, or, uh, beta z acts by through beta on my point x, and I want this limit to exist. So once again, I can I can sort of draw this in a picture. So let me uh, move back up. Sorry, uh, to my I can't fit all this on the screen exactly. Let me just scroll up for one second. So I'm here. Um, if I draw my beta, so if I'm in this picture here, if I draw my beta, like say down here, for instance, here's my parameter beta, I can draw it as a direction um, in, in this picture here. Again, this is some type checking. If you think about what F and, and so-and-so is, F is a subtorus, blah, 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 whatever. Oh, sorry, it's a co-direction. Anyway, I, I draw beta in this picture um, and then I see like what, what things flow off to infinity under beta. So if, if I'm in this bottom part of my green hyperplane arrangement here, then I do flow off to infinity, right? Beta is just going to push me there. But if I'm in this top part here, then I don't, then I sort of get stuck here when, when I hit the fixed point. So in this case, my sort of LG of alpha beta is going to equal 
um, I'm going to have my P1 and I'm going to have one of these fins coming off of it, but not the other one. So this is a stable envelope? Uh, this is the support of the stable envelope. So this 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 thing is sort of like a, somehow like a net, to get varieties on both sides. My perspective on this thing, whatever it is, is like to get varieties on both sides. I don't know. This is I, I impose these parameters alpha and beta. These are what the physicists call the uh, FI parameter and the mass parameter. And kind of uh, I, I, I end up I end up with with this thing. Um, there's there's more sophisticated ways to say it. Uh, maybe I, I uh, won't get into it right now. Um, but uh, th this is also, let me say, the skeleton. This is the uh, category O skeleton. So um, this is uh, this notion of a category. So of course, category O for a, for a group G goes back to a, um, a, I don't know Bernstein, Gelfand, Gelfand maybe. Uh, uh, it goes back a, a long time, but sort of uh, Braden, Proudfoot, Lakata, Webster, um, Braden, Proud, Lakata, Proudfoot, and Webster introduced this sort of generalized category O for a general sort of hypertoric variety, or even for a general quiver variety, um, and or a general symplectic resolution, and, and studied these things. And somehow, like their definition of category O is like some category of microlocal sheaves, microlocal perverse sheaves, or deformation quantization modules, or something on, on, on this Lagrangian. I'll say category O is equal to DQ modules on this Lagrangian. So that's what this, this category O is. So that's very nice because if you remember, like the, the things I said at the beginning was that the Lagrangian, well, I guess I, I didn't, um, if I go back to my formulation in my beginning, um, I, I guess I didn't say where the Lagrangian comes from, but it's going to be a singular support condition here. Um, and so somehow, like in, in the end, what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to uh, I'm going to get something that's like some categorification of the original category O. I'm studying some kind of perverse or coherent object supported on that Lagrangian. Uh, so, uh, Ben, uh, kind of uh, a little bit more precise. I mean. Uh, when you speak about DQ modules supported on something, does this something have to be smooth, or it doesn't? Um, you know, that's a good question. I mean, in, in this case, uh, this Lagrangian is a union of smooth components. Um, so, I in this case, you don't have to worry about that question because you can always just ask for like the the union, you know, the category generated by the sort of simple uh, modules on, on those components. Um, in, in general, I, I, I would not want to require it to be smooth. I mean, I should maybe I'm I'm less familiar with the DQ module setting. To me, I prefer to be on the other side of Riemann Hilbert and look at microlocal perverse sheaves, and you can define that on some arbitrarily singular Lagrangian, basically. Yeah, but uh, uh, my question is indeed rather about this Riemann Hilbert because uh, outside of even even the conventional Riemann Hilbert is highly non-trivial, as you know, and so I mean you assume as kind of uh, building blocks something which is very very far from being understood. Well, okay, so right, so sorry. Yes, I, I know that you know you, you have a lot of work um, um, with with Maxime on on this sort of generalized Riemann Hilbert correspondence. Um, I don't propose to be saying so much about that right now. I I, I just sort of in my talk, I, I you know tend to to go back and forth. Um, is certainly like the sort of most sophisticated version of Riemann Hilbert. I you know I, I don't want to appeal to, but I'm I'm just sort of appealing to much more naive statements. Like if I'm looking at like a basic Riemann Hilbert of like D modules, regular holonomic D modules versus perverse sheaves, um, yeah. and yeah. you know maybe some there's some I should mention some work in progress of sort of you know uh, generalizations of statements like this, sort of micro localizing it. Um, there's one group, well, I think Vivek, uh, there was some paper by Vivek Shende, Chris Po, David Nadler, and Laurent Cote that defined microlocal perverse sheaves in some generality, I think ultimately with the goal of, of understanding Riemann Hilbert better. And there's also work in progress of Pavel Safranov and, and uh, Sam Gunningham proving that um, uh, sort of homes of simple deformation quantization modules are computed by this DT sheaf, which lives on a minus one shifted symplectic thing. 
Um, so there's there's various groups doing things, but I and of course as as, as uh, Jan and Maxime, uh, but but of course I, I don't mean to uh, I don't mean to make any any claims on this front. And in fact, one of the morals of my talk, if I get there, which which I may not at this rate, is um, to sort of uh, show off that actually it's important to keep track of different kinds of the, the Betty thing will naturally appear on one side and the Durham thing will naturally appear on the other side. So actually it's best not to apply Riemann Hilbert and it's best to remember the difference between those two things somehow. Um, so, so okay. Uh, and, un under this mysterious, still for me mysterious 3D mirror symmetry, uh, the mm -hmm. Betty objects on one side uh, correspond to the RAM objects on the other one, yeah? Right, so, well, uh, uh, yeah, at, at least what, what I'm going to say is that if we looked at my original statement, I, I had some kind of, uh, uh, basically the, the, the moral, which, which I'll say in, in a moment, is that I have some two categories, and I'm going to take HP of those two categories. I'm going to take sort of some kind of periodic cyclic homology. And uh, on, on the A side, I'm going to end up with Betty objects. And on the B side, I'm going to end mm -hmm. up with a sort of Durham object. So then HP of these two category equivalences, it's sort of a Riemann Hilbert. So that's a message, yeah? Uh, no, well, no, because it's also a, a, like a 3D mirror symmetry somehow. Uh, it's it's uh it's it's uh it's a uh, I mean it, it it it's Betty objects on I mean it's Betty objects on one thing and Durham objects on a dual space. Oh yeah, okay. So it's not. I remember when I first saw this talk of, of Maxime in, in twenty sixteen at String Math about a uh, generalized Riemann Hilbert. He kept saying it's not mirror symmetry, but in this case, no, it really is mirror symmetry. But uh, but it also switches the the Betty and Durham objects. But okay, but okay, but on on the mirror dual, uh, whatever symplectic stacks or vari symplectic varieties, 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 yeah, varieties, and you have no idea how to uh, uh, to say that two uh, um, uh, symplectic varieties are mirror dual uh, un unless you check equivalence of some two categories. <laughs> uh... There is no well, like S S Y Z proposal. There's no S Y Z. No, yes, that's exactly the uh, that's exactly the uh, you know that I would say one of the gaps in our understanding of three D mirror symmetry is we don't currently have a direct geometric thing like S Y Z to tell you that two things are dual. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the the best thing to do is to understand sort of the the duality. Uh, uh, yes, as some two categories associated to these gauge theories. I understand that like once you know that. Um, Luckily, I don't know. Physicists have various predictions, but I don't maybe have very many better ways to uh, to know it than that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, well, now I'd better get to to two categories. Um, so let me. Uh, so okay. So let me let me remind you of our of our basic duality of stacks, which I just had up a second ago. Let me just put it up again so we remember it. T star c to the n mod g is dual to T star of c to the n mod f check. Um, so I can sort of state, let, let me just state, uh, state the, the main theorem of our first paper, which, as I said, Justin has, has talked about previously at, at this seminar. So you can look up his talk if you want to see it again. Uh, Gamage, Maisel, G, Hilburn, um, which, uh, okay, maybe I'm, I'm not going to define these two categories here, but I'll say that the, the theorem can be understood as follows, perverse sheaves of categories on C to the N mod G with singular support in, in this LG um, is equivalent to coherent sheaves of categories on uh, C to the N mod F check with singular support in this L F check. This is without imposing any parameters. So this is sort of the statement you would get if you were interested in, in the duality between these two stacks. Um, and and the, the basic case of this duality is um, sort of perverse sheaves of categories on uh, C with singular support in zero section union a cotangent fiber. Um, and this, uh, so when I say perverse sheaves of categories, I'm referring of course to this uh, concept of perverse Schobers, which is invented by uh, Kapranov and Schechtman. And in this case, they figured out that it was this two category. Well, they didn't have uh, two categories, but uh, they figured out that in this case, what you have is uh, spherical functors so this is a concept invented by Irina Ono and developed by her and uh, Timothy Logvinenko. And uh, of course, the notion of spherical objects probably dates back further to sort of 
uh, I don't know, people, people were interested in Fukaya categories that have spheres in them, and these spheres have Dane twists, and they have some interesting properties. Um, so, so uh, you know, it was sort of, uh, I don't know, people have been studying this, this spherical stuff for a while now. Um, so this two category of spherical functors, I'll just remind you briefly, is a, a spherical functor or a spherical adjunction is a, a pair of adjoint functors between two two categories with the property that if I take the unit and co-unit maps, so one goes to FRF, FFR goes to the unit on D, and I can take the cones on these two things. So this is a natural transformation of functors. I take the kernel or co-kernel of it. That gives me a new functor. And I want to demand that those resulting functors are invertible, that they're not just endo functors, they're auto functors. OK? So that's what my sort of, uh, just to give you a flavor of what this perverse sheaves of categories thing is. Um, and on the other side, uh, what I have is um, this coherent sheaves of categories on um, on C mod C star, singular support in my, again, C union T star zero mod C star. Um, this thing is, uh, by definition, it's modules over some uh, monoidal category, um, namely this category. Then it's not uh, visible what are subscripts uh, coherent sheets. Sorry, sorry. Well, it's the it's same. Supported. It's the it's the same Lagrangian. Sorry, it's ah, it's the same Lagrangian. Lagrangian. I mean, it's it's a you know C union the cotangent fiber to zero mod C star. It's 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 always the same Lagrangian right now. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so this this two category whatever it is 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 modules over this monoidal category. So uh, the, the, the point uh, that, that I would like to make here is that kind of uh, ultimately on the, on the B side, we're studying these kind of, when we're in a side of a cotangent bundle, we're studying these convolution monoidal categories that are like very familiar from mm, geometric representation theory, whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I could write this if I liked, I could write this as a matrix, right? I could write this as a matrix of, uh, you know, modules over coherent sheaves on the various fiber products. So C fiber product with C uh, over C, that's just C. Then I get zero, zero. And here I get the fiber product of zero with itself over C. Um, and then I'm taking C star quotients for all of those. Mod C star, mod C star, mod C star, mod C star. So I don't know, this is some explicit thing. It's some matrix of coherent sheaves of categories with push forwards and stuff. Um, it's very fun to, uh, to work around with. And you know it's it's our theorem that this sort of like controls spherical functors. Um, okay, so uh, uh, now now I, I I want to start decategorifying everything. So um, our goal we we have we have uh, we have two goals here. Goals. So one is uh, to decategorify. Decategorify and relate to known invariants. And two is what I would like to do is understand um, restriction to the stable locus, right? So this was a duality for stacks, but I'd like to impose the parameters alpha and beta and then decategorify and hopefully recover some statements about causal duality, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so let me first say something about how to decategorify. Um, so let me say something about traces. So if C is a two category, and let me assume that C has a compact generator. Um, uh, so in that case, uh, you know, just like if a category has a compact generator, it's equal to endomorphisms over its compact generator. So the same thing for a two category. So in other words, I'm saying that I can present my two category as A mod, where A is some monoidal category, right? So this happened right above. I presented this two category of coherent sheaves of categories as modules over some monoidal category, where, oh yeah, the monoidal structure was by convolution, obviously. You know, push forward and pull back um, along the triple fiber product. Um, okay, so in this case, I can define uh, two notions of trace. There's a sort of categorical trace. I'll call this a capital trace of C. Um, and this is, uh, I take A tensored with A over A tensor A up. Um, sorry, I'll write tensor up here. So the point is when I write A tensor A, 
tensor op, I mean that I'm taking the opposite monoidal structure, um, not, not doing anything uh, to the cadet. So this is like what you would do. This is the formula for Hochschild homology, right? Or the sort of universal trace of, a, of an algebra. I'm just doing it for an algebra object in categories. That is a monoidal category. So this is what I'll call the categorical trace. Um, and then I have this uh, lowercase trace, um, which is just the more naive thing, which is I have a category called A, and I can take its Hochschild homology. Um, this is what you might call the naive trace. And there's some theorem of, uh, this is a theorem of uh, gate scoring, uh, um, Kajdan, Rosenblum, Varshavsky, maybe, if I have that right, um, that says that, uh, or at least that's where I learned it from, is their paper on this toy model for Stuka's thing. Um, that says that uh, if I take the endomorphisms inside of this uh, categorical trace of the unit, so I have the unit of my monoidal category that sort of uh, naturally lands, you know, it lands inside of this trace. So it's an object inside of this category, um, and that is equal to the naive trace. So the point is that kind of the naive trace is seeing some smaller piece of the whole categorical trace. Um, if I like, you know, maybe I, I can think of the naive trace as like the category of modules over this Hochschild homology. Um, and then what, what this theorem is saying is that it's seeing, you know, it's seeing precisely the subcategory generated by the unit. Um, so, right, what do I want to say here? Um, okay, uh, I guess it depends on how much time I have left. So it looks like I'm, I'm getting close to an hour. Um, well, again, you can continue, as, as I said, you can go over the time until okay. you, you decide that you, you, you said something kind of that you can stop. Okay, thank you. So if that's the case, then maybe maybe I'll take some, some extra minutes so I can make a, a, some, of, some of the statements that, that I'd like to make here. Um, so I, I won't have to hurry too much. Maybe, maybe I can... Um, uh, well, okay, first let, let me let me sort of say uh, one statement right away, and then let me uh, let me sort of uh, 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 about this categorical trace, and then afterward I'm going to make some statements about the naive trace. So first I just want to state this theorem of myself and, and Justin, um, which is a Betty version of an earlier theorem that Justin proved with Sam Raskin. Um, and so if I take this equivalence, which I had above, and I apply this sort of basic case here, and I apply categorical trace to it, what do I get? So if I take the trace of this perverse sheaves of categories on C with this singular support L, whatever, same singular support as always, um, and I can also take the, the categorical trace of this coherent sheaves of categories on C mod C star, again, with this basic uh, same singular support as always, um, and of course, we, we proved an equivalence of categories, so their categorical traces had better be equal. And then what we did is we identified these on each side. So on the left-hand side, this turns out to be sheaves on the loop space of C. So this is some kind of in scheme of loops. You can think of this as sort of an infinite dimensional vector space. Um, people sometimes write this as C Laurent polynomials T, that it's sort of infinite dimensional and like the, the basis is given by like the coefficients in a, in a, uh, a Laurent polynomial expansion of a map from the sort of formal punctured disk into C. Um, and this is not the category of all sheaves, but it's sheaves which are sort of constructible with respect to a certain stratification. And it's the stratification by loop order. So if I think of this loops on C as some space of Laurent polynomials, I can ask, what's the lowest order term in my Laurent polynomial? Like, what's the degree of my loop? So how much, you know, uh, zero or pole does it have? Um, and, uh, and, and, and that's what, what this category is. That's what this categorical trace is. And on the other side, um, what I get is I get coherent sheaves on the Betty loop space of C mod C star. So this Betty loop space is a map from uh, the uh, topological circle into C mod C star. Um, and it has a very explicit expression. Um, and so we, we prove that these things are equivalent and moreover that they're equivalent as module categories 
as module categories for, um, so these things have an action of some monoidal category. Namely, on the left-hand side, I have an action of local systems on the space of loops on C star. And on the right-hand side, I have an action of coherent sheaves on the Betty loop space of BC star. And these things are equivalent and these things act on here. Um, so this, this, this was meant to give you a flavor of what the categorical trace is. So the categorical trace really is like putting your two category on a circle. So you're like adding a loop to your situation. Um, and, and, and things can become, can become somewhat complicated when you do that. Um, uh, maybe, maybe I ought to just to clarify this statement here, loop space of C star, roughly speaking, you know, at the level of sort of like, since I'm only interested in local systems on this, I can ask like up to homotopy, what is this thing? And roughly speaking, it looks like C star times Z, right? If I think about the, the geometric, the free loop space of C star, <laughs> I have like a point where my loop can be, that's my C star point, And then I have a number of a winding number, which is Z. Um, and similarly over here, the Betty loop space of BC star, this thing is equivalent to just C star times BC star. Um, where sort of, again, I, I have my BC star and then I have this C star, which is like a, uh, telling you that like a, the sort of the, the monodromy of my circle uh, can be a group element, you know, of course, from coming from this stack. And then like on, on the bottom, this equivalence is like local systems on C star, looks like coherent sheaves on C star, local systems on Z looks like coherent sheaves on BC star. Um, so uh, ultimately, um, well, okay. So so that that that's that's meant to be a theorem that gives you a sense of like what what this sort of categorical trace thing does. Uh, but uh, now I'd like to move to a, a sort of simpler uh, situation, um, namely the sort of naive trace. And in fact, uh, an even simpler version of the naive trace. So let me go up here. I have a if I think about how trace works um, and what Hochschild homology is. These things are, are not just sort of categories, but they, they have a sort of S1 action on them. Um, and so I can take uh, S1, um, uh, S1 uh, fixed points here. Um, and even better, I can take the sort of Tate fixed points. Um, so maybe uh, let me write this here. Easier to understand um, is I can take the sort of periodic cyclic trace. Um, so I'll call this trace Tate S1 um, of C. So what this is, this ends up being taking Tate fixed points is the same thing as if I take Tate S1 fixed points on Hochschild homology, that gives me something called the periodic cyclic homology. Whatever, periodic cyclic homology of A. Um, and this invariant of periodic cyclic homology is very nice uh, because it sort of turns algebra into topology. That is, if I have a um, if I have a uh, a scheme, then its periodic cyclic homology uh, is is something like the Durham cohomology of of the scheme. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, maybe let me let me say that right now. So um, so uh, the if I take this uh, Tate S one uh, trace of my sort of perverse sheaves of categories. Um, uh, what is TS1? So it's Tate S1 fixed points. Ah, TS1, ah, okay. Tate fixed points. So the point is that this trace has a circle action and I can take a, a, a fixed points for this circle action. That gives me a sort of negative cyclic or negative cyclic trace invariance or co-invariance and then the sort of uh, uh, cofiber of the map between invariance and co-invariance th that's called the Tate construction. And uh, that gives me this periodic cyclic thing. Um, so I'm, I'm supposed to imagine that like, uh, you know, the HH, there's this HKR theorem that says HH of, uh, of a variety looks like uh, um, differential forms on the variety. And then this Tate S1 thing, it corresponds to turning on the Durham differential. So kind of if you take differential forms and turn on a Durham differential, then you get just Durham cohomology of the variety. So it kind of, it, it's turning algebra into topology somehow. Um, uh, well, uh, again, I mean, from the uh, uh, from the uh, far space, yes, but technically your HP uh, combines together even an odd cohomology 
and how do you distinguish them and, and do you need to distinguish them um uh, well you mean that uh you mean that it collapses the grade it collapses the grading to z mod 2 is what you're saying yes and so whether it's important for you or not no for uh for now i'm 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 happily sort of now that i'm i'm passing to this tedas one thing i'm i'm collapsing my grading on cohomology to a, to a z mod 2 grading hmm. Um, so I, I agree that it would be nice to, to restore that grading, and, and there's probably ways that you can, but, but for the moment, I'd like to just collapse that grading. Um, so uh, let, let, me, let me say, let me say what, what these calculations are for this. So if I take this perverse sheaves of categories on C to the N with singular support in my big Lagrangian L, um, then this sort of periodic cyclic, this is the sort of periodic cyclic trace here of this is going to recover perverse sheaves on C to the N. With singular support in L, um, uh, Z mod two. Uh, I'll write a Z mod two here to say that I'm too periodic now in my grading. So I've sort of taken this this category and tensored it over some too periodic uh, thing. Um, but this is good. This tells me that like whatever I'm doing, um, my perverse sheaves of categories thing. When I take uh, when I take this periodic cyclic trace thing, I am recovering actual perverse sheaves. So uh, th that's very good. And then I can ask what what happens on the on the other side here. So what happens if I take my uh, uh, Tate uh, S one fixed points on this coherent sheaves of categories on so the on, on some say C to the n mod G singular support in, in this L. Um, and uh, so let me re remind you that this uh, that this coherent sheaves of categories on C to the N mod G was, was some convolution, was modules over something of the form that looked like coherent sheaves on some fiber product, like X times with Y over X, um, some G equivariant coherent sheaves on here, mod. Right, this, this was the form of, of what, the, what I meant by coherent sheaves of categories on C to the N mod G with some like G equivariant coherent sheaves on, on some fiber product of, of schemes. And so what this ends up being here is, um, this is by a churn character map. The sort of uh, best thing to say here is that this is a sort of um, a G equivariant Borel Moore K theory of this fiber product, sort of complexified. I don't know, complex topological Borel Moore G equivariant K theory of, of this fiber product um, is, is what this thing ends up being. So th that's a lot of adjectives, but um, uh, the, the point is here that um, without the G, note, um, if G is, is trivial, then, um, you know, uh, Borel-Moore K-theory of whatever is just the uh, uh, equivalent to Borel-Moore homology, right? And um, Borel-Moore homology of... Uh, this Borel more like Durham cohomology of uh, you know of some fiber product like this. Um, this thing here is equivalent to some endomorphism um, in the category of D modules on Y of like the functions D module pushed forward from X. So this 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 equivalence here on on the right hand side is is kind of the trick that. Um, that that uh, that Ben Webster uses in pretty much like every paper that he writes is like that you know if you want to study endomorphisms inside of some category of, of DQ modules or uh, you, you know you present it inside some category of D modules and then you say that oh the endomorphisms for this thing is Borel Moore homology of some uh, uh, of some of some fiber product um, and so I'm saying that like if if you ignore the sort of group action. I um, mean, in particular, if you sort of impose a stability condition, so you don't have to worry about this uh, extra equivariance thing, then you're in precisely that situation. So that's what this decategorification gives you on the B side, is it's giving you um, some something that's an endomorphism inside a category of D modules. So that's the sense in which the, the A and B sides are living on two different sides of, uh, of Riemann-Hilbert. So maybe I'll, uh, I'll, I'll say uh, uh, sort of one more thing and then I'll, I'll sort of uh, uh, de declare myself uh, mostly done here um, uh, because I, I sort of, I, I've partly accomplished my goal up above of telling you some things about decategorification, but I really wanted to decategorify um, 
to category O, which meant restricting to the stable locus. Um, and so maybe I'll, I'll just state the sort of uh, the theorem here. So this is um, the work of mine and Justin's that is still in preparation, hopefully will be uh, up soon, um, which is basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this theorem here, um, our, our main theorem from our previous paper, and I'm going to restrict to the stable locus. So I'm going to restrict to this mu alpha. And so what that means is that I'm, I'm restricting, I need to have a sort of micro local understanding of these things. So if I understand this, this left-hand side and right-hand side as being like, uh, you know, perverse or coherent sheaves of categories with some singular support condition, I want to sort of micro localize away from the uh, unstable locus. So the way I can state my theorem is that uh, the theorem is roughly speaking that sort of if I look at micro local perverse sheaves of categories, whatever that means on my sort of stable Lagrangian LG of alpha beta that I defined up in the first part of this talk, that's going to be equal to micro local coherent sheaves of categories on my LF check of beta alpha. Mm -hmm. And then um, if I take uh, sort of the, um, the uh, this periodic cyclic trace, Tate S1, if I take this periodic cyclic trace, then what am I going to get? Then from what I've told you on this left-hand side, I'm going to get microlocal perverse sheaves on LG of alpha beta. So this is the sort of Betty category O. And over here on the right-hand side, I'm going to get some uh, uh, DQ modules on my, on my uh, hypertoric variety. I guess I called it X F check of, of beta, um, supported on this Lagrangian L F check of beta alpha. So this you might call Durham category O. And uh, so therefore I get this equivalence between them. And moreover, this equivalence switches the, uh, the projectives on the left-hand side correspond to the simples on the right-hand side. So this is the, the sort of feature of this causal duality type equivalence. So an equivalence of this form was found by Braden Proudfoot Licata Webster in their sort of first paper on, on these uh, hypertoric varieties. And now I'm sort of uh, giving you some justification from the world of two categories and I'm also giving you some like uh, some some notes about um, about kind of what what thing is on is on what side. Um, so okay, I, I could uh, you know give more details about what I mean by the two the two categories in this theorem, but I've been over time a little bit now, so maybe I'll, I'll stop here and then let people ask questions. So thanks. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so questions, please. Uh, yes, I do have a few questions. Um, okay, first, can you explain about this uh, Schubert uh, categorical shifts when you say support with a singular support? Uh, yes. So right. So we, we don't have a um, uh, we don't have a good definition in general right now. Um, <laughs> I would say that uh, right. So what do I have? We we don't have a definition in general. So uh, what, but in the case when basically what I'm using here is that I have a, a singular support condition, which is a union of co-normals to, uh, to, to, um, uh, to a, a strata, to a stratification of C to the N. And that stratification is, comes from some hyperplane arrangement in C to the N. I see. So in this case, so that the perverse shift is still kind of an analog of the constructible shifts. So you well, so the point is that the point is that yeah, we we have some is that Caprano Schechtman like gave some in their de original paper. They gave some definition of perverse Schober, and at the very least, in in this uh, in this situation right here, right where I'm looking at a perverse Schober on C with singular yeah. support in zero and and the rest of it, um, okay. sort of like a perverse Schober on C with only singularity at zero. Like we know what a perverse sheaf on C with only singularity at zero is. Right, it's like vanishing cycles and nearby cycles and some maps between them, and they sort of gave us this. And now I'm telling you that my L, my LG is just a product of. I'm just putting myself in a product of that situation there. Um, okay. and, and then I'm, and then you know what I'm, what I'm doing here is when I micro localize, um, I'm sort of restricting to. I'm thinking about you know I'm, I'm imitating what micro localization does for perverse sheaves. And uh, I, I'm doing the same operation. So I'm like maybe deleting some vanishing cycles or killing some simple objects or, or something like that. 
I see, because I was also thinking on the other side that for coherent shifts, and in cases you are dealing with D modules, so the macro local or the signal support, that seems to be making sense. But in the right, yes, and so sort of like the, this notion of like it might seem weird to talk about you know coherent sheaves of categories with a singular support condition, but as I said, when I take my sort of periodic cyclic decategorification, it looks more like some category of D modules with a singular support condition. So that that you know should be kind of more familiar somehow. Mm -hmm. And my second question is about the um the the trace category, and mm -hmm. uh, which um. Uh, you stated you know much more general uh, than what I can comprehend. But uh, me for go back to trait thesis, and if you deal with the infinite dimensional vector spaces and trait defines how and uh, try to manage to def to define some kind of a topology, so one can define the uh, traces. So mm -hmm. that is 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 that kind of a, just a baby version of what you're doing here? But the all possible traces that form a sort of category. Um, it's yeah, it, well, it's it's uh, it's definitely related somehow. I mean, this this LC when I when I wrote here that this thing is an in scheme, uh, maybe it's it's better mm -hmm. to, it's it's good it's better to think of this. What this thing is is it's a Tate vector space. Um, okay. And I would say that this kind of like Tate vector space appears on the left hand side precisely like when I try and take this categorical trace here. Um, okay. Okay. That that ends up being like the the right way to the right way to present this. So kind of you need those tools in order to describe the geometry that appears when you take one of these uh, one of these traces. And so so the category of shifts uh, with a, a corresponding to the stratification. So that yes. So in in order to define this category of sheaves, I needed to use somehow. You might say the topology on the Tate vector space comes from it's like an increasing union of of some uh, of some sort of other vector spaces and kind of like to define this category of sheaves, I need to use that structure of an increasing union. Okay, and also, well, there is a also there is a increasing of union, but also there is a completion in. in on the other hand. Yes. So yeah, it, somehow like that that it's all the, the structure of this is a Tate vector space is necessary in order to define what I mean by by sheaves mm -hmm. on it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So Sam Raskin has a paper titled something like infinite dimensional methods in in something D modules. And and it's exactly like on this issue of like how do you use that structure to define the category of D modules um on this thing. And I'm I'm doing a sort of Betty version of that. Okay. Well, thank you. That explained well. Um, okay, that's not all my question yet. More questions? So in, in your abstract, you mentioned this uh, Fukaya footer categories. So, ah. but uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, I understand that well, it should be on the beta side. Yes. So right. So this the this this micro local uh, th this uh, micro local perverse uh, sheaves of categories thing um, is it, you know conjecturally uh, sort of uh, the Fukaya footer two category of this X alpha you know with with some uh, with a sort of super potential or with this L alpha beta kind of as my singular support condition. Um, so uh, uh, can it, you recall for people because it's something which people can understand intuitively if not yes that. yes so maybe if i if i go back to to this if i go back to to this uh this uh, simpler well may, maybe i'll just draw a picture so you know I, I have some singular so i have some like you know i'm in my t star p1 case for example with this is my lagrangian um and then kind of this this bukaya food or two category food or has is some two category with um, the objects of this two category are holomorphic Lagrangians in my holomorphic symplectic variety. Um, the Homs uh, between L1 and L2 um, have, uh, so this is supposed to be a two category. So maybe I should say the sort of uh, uh, one morphisms. So if I have two Lagrangians, then the one morphisms should come from their sort of intersections. So I have like L1 and L2, and I have a one morphism here coming from their intersections. And then um, my sort of two morphisms, if I have like uh, uh, some Lagrangians 
uh, say like L1 and L2 and they're intersecting in you know multiple points and I want to compose those intersections or something, then um, the two morphisms come from some kind of holomorphic disk, holomorphic disk um, with boundary on those Lagrangians and hitting the intersection points. And then the uh, composition comes from uh, three balls um, with sort of boundary on those Lagrangians and the disks, and they satisfy um, this, uh, this Fuder equation. So it's maps of a three manifold into a hyperkähler manifold. So I have this, this equation here called I del X plus J del Y plus K del Z is equal to zero. Um, so that's that gives it the the name footer. Uh, so th this yeah, this footer when when uh, when uh, did he leave? Uh, I mean, I, I, nineteen I like nineteen thirties forties I think, uh -huh. like first half of the twentieth century. So he was a he was a Swiss mathematician who uh, wrote down this this differential equation here. Uh, which has turned out to play a major role in, in, in a lot of gauge theory. And also just, if you think about hyperkähler manifolds, it's a very natural differential equation to, to write down. Um, and so may, maybe uh, just to give sort of a, an example. So, okay, so I, in this case, of course, this, this category is, is, this two category is self-dual in the sense that on the other side, I have, you know, my coherent uh, two category, microlocal coherent two category on, on sort of the same thing. Um, which if I were to write this down, this looks like some two category that looks like coherent sheaves on P1, coherent sheaves on C, coherent sheaves on zero, coherent sheaves on zero. Um, and somehow the point is that these categories by 3D mirror symmetry are supposed to be computing endomorphisms inside of my footer two category. So kind of, if I think about like coherent sheaves on P1 looks like uh, modules over the Kronecker quiver, this is a famous uh, presentation of coherent sheaves on P1. On the mirror side, um, these uh, these are supposed to be, these sort of vertices are supposed to be one morphisms. They're supposed to correspond to intersections of Lagrangians. And these two morphisms in my category are supposed to correspond to holomorphic disks. Um, uh, so, uh, so again, uh, so you have, uh, this category of representations of some uh, quiver, yeah, all right. Yeah, so I, I'm saying that kind of this category by by what, sort of three D mirror are, symmetry. What are the two morphisms in? You want to upgrade it, so this is kind. No, of... no, the, the this 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 is an endomorphism category inside of my two category. So the objects of this uh -huh. of this category are are uh, one morphisms in my two category. Mm hmm. Okay, so then the the morphis the two morphisms will be functors, whatever. Yeah, so the the objects well the objects in this category are the one morphisms in my two category, and the morphisms in this category are the two morphisms in my two category. Yeah. So kind of the, this my 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 theorem now it gives you this beautiful picture like predicting for you what the the sort of Lagrangian holomorphic Lagrangian intersection theory and Fudor maps and everything is going to be in in the two category. Although I should, I need to make a, a slight correction to what I just said, because this is one of those things, as I said in the example of quasi maps, where it was important to know the underlying gauge theory. So these, these things here, these arrows here, are actually not going to correspond to holomorphic disks inside of my uh, uh, thing. They're going to correspond to like solutions of the vortex equation, because I really had this T star of C2 mod C star, and like I might have these sort of holomorphic disks that you know hit, hit the sort of stacky point i mean somehow like the it be, the holomorphic disk equation becomes the vortex equation in a gauge theory uh, you mean the two morphisms it's not just what you kind of naively depicted on the right things it, 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 uh, yeah they they would be, they, right the two morphisms that would be as i naively depicted if i were only considering the variety t star p1 but somehow like really in order to get a, a good answer i need to understand its compactification inside of uh, t star of c2 mod c star mm -hmm. uh, and presumably this has to do with the fact that certain moduli spaces which naturally appear in the theory are um are, uh, are are not compact and like if you look at the compactifications of these you know vortex or footer moduli spaces or whatever you, you need some extra extra bits i don't know uh, yeah of course probably and another part of mathematics because kind of 
Uh, okay. Yes. All right. Uh, more questions? Last chance. So Ben, may I ask you to uh, email me your notes? If, if yes, possible. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay, great. Well, if there are no more questions, thank you very much. Very interesting and inspiring talk. And this is it for today. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Thanks for having me, everyone. And uh, 